This is The One Thing Podcast, and I'm your host, Dr. Adam Rindy. The One Thing Podcast brings together leaders in functional and naturopathic medicine to discuss actionable information that may unlock puzzles in the areas of gut health, brain health, metabolism, and longevity. Please note, these episodes do not replace the opinion of your doctor. They are not intended to diagnose or treat any condition. Please discuss this information with your provider and discuss your own unique personal health history before adapting this information. Please subscribe to our episodes so that you can stay on top of the most current information in these areas of medicine. In this episode, we speak on meditation with Solomon Ezra Berezin, who is a health coach out of the Houston, Texas area, who I've come to know over the last year or so. We're going to speak about meditation, and since this is such a big topic, I have a follow-up post on this topic on my website at www.soundintegrative.com in the blog section, where we break down some more details about meditation. In today's episode, we're going to learn about Solomon's experience with meditation and guiding others through meditation. We'll get some introduction on the topic of meditation, understand what he experienced during his several meditation retreats that he went on. It's a very good conversation to understand all the benefits of meditation and sort of the the inner world of how to practice from some from a beginner perspective, but also goes into some of the more deeper aspects of mindfulness and breaking negative thought patterns and habits that may be involved with expressing um, in our health. So I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. This was really a conversation between two colleagues and friends, and um, so we we're a little less formal than usual, but I hope that you enjoy all that was gleaned from um, Solomon's sharing on this topic that is near and dear to him. So without further delay, I welcome you to the next episode of the One Thing Podcast. Hello, I'm Dr. Adam Rindy, and welcome to the One Thing Podcast. I'm excited today to bring on my friend and colleague, Solomon Ezra Berezin. He is going to speak with us about meditation, and um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, Let me give you a little bit of a background before I welcome on Solomon. He's a certified transformational nutrition coach. He's a former college basketball athlete. His focus in his practice is as a coach is improving health and sports performance with mindset, meditation, nutrition, and fitness. And um, he's designing future visions, releasing undesired habits, and more. Um, he is someone who's been practicing meditation for several years. And so far, he has uh, attended and experienced two meditation retreats that transformed his life. And we'll be talking about those today. So I'm going to welcome on Solomon. Hey, Solomon. Hey, how are you doing, Dr. Adam? Good. Nice to see you again. You as well. Yeah. So I um, thought we could just sort of talk a little bit about how we <laughs> met first and um, our friend, uh uh, Moses, Moses introduced us. Um, he told me, you've got to meet this this guy. He's interested in health and basketball. <laughs> that was it's his nice intro. your side of the story. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was enough for me because those are two of my, uh, obviously, my interests as well. So, uh-huh. yeah, what did he tell you? Well, I, um, I think our um, parents are good friends. So when I came to Seattle and uh, met him, uh, at the time, you know, as I've been growing kind of my health coaching practice, I wanted to work alongside somebody in the nutrition kind of field. And uh, I was just sharing how the work that I'm doing and growing in health coaching uh, and getting to know other people in the field like yourself. And that's how he made the connection. And he sent me your number and then we were having a phone call. Yeah. So then we we ended up going on a hike together um, to a place called Poo Poo Point, which is 
Poop, poop, poop. has infamous name in, in Issaquah, um, Issaquah, Washington, and went on a very nice hike that overlooks the Puget Sound. We saw a beautiful view of Mount Rainier that day. And, you know, we, we had many conversations along the way, some about health and spirituality. Um, and, uh, you know, I felt in some sense that I was talking to a younger, more evolved version of myself because <laughs> you're going deeper, deeper um, in this process than I did at, at your age. And, um, but it was just really an enlightening conversation. Thank you. So, yeah, um, I, you know, I think we wanted to set the stage for today. I think um, what I always like to do when we're talking about a topic that some people might not be familiar with, um, even though meditation mm -hmm. is mainstream these days, um, mm -hmm. it's just to kind of set a, set a structure around it. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is meditation from a perspective of um, its impact on health and well-being and um, mental health, physical health, emotional health, and um, just sort of sharing some of your experiences with meditation and how you walk people through this process. Um, so with that being said, when was the first time you were introduced to meditation? Um, I actually was thinking about this recently because I'd been practicing it daily uh, for a little over two years now, maybe two and a half years, but I got interest, introduced to it uh, by a very good friend, uh, I call her like my second mother, um, a family friend, who I think first introduced it to me, you know, in high school, because uh, I had this nail biting habit. Uh, and I really like I wanted to stop, but it was so subconscious that it was, you know, nothing was kind of helping. And so I, from what I can remember at this moment, she just would uh, kind of guide a little, you know, maybe 10 minute visualization of sorts. And, you know, here and there, it slowly grew. You know, I fell asleep like the first few times, of course, but, uh, you know, then what's led to today is, you know, a, a great cultivated practice that, you know, I aspire to continue growing. Excellent. So when people think of meditation, you know, something might come to their mind. So some people might think of meditation where you say some type of mantra over and over and over. I think that comes from the roots of transcendental meditation. Mm -hmm. Some people might think of that you're supposed to clear your mind and not think of anything. Um, some people might think of actually you're supposed to do some visualization or think of certain thoughts or visions. What how would you kind of set us up with the different kind of subtypes of meditation? And so people understand that. Yeah, it's a good question. I think also when it comes to kind of, you know, lots of things, we have to see what our preconceived notions and what we understand about it is. So when I was first getting into meditation, I was also recognizing, you know, in different movies, you may see, uh, somebody practicing meditation or doing or talking about somebody who does meditation and it's usually often um, portrayed as somebody you know an eastern religion or some you know like the weird guy in the movies um, so the more and more you get to get into it I mean there's different approaches you have like you mentioned the visualization uh, the mantras I haven't really tried the transcendental meditation or like focusing on um, different mantras. Um, but you can focus on breath. And uh, as I'll share later about the um, meditation or the Vipassana meditation retreat, a lot of it is focusing on the breath. Uh, you can focus on your sensations on the body. And then you can take it further into visualization uh, you know, in like in the Jude uh, Jewish tradition, you can focus on a letter because the letter is a um, a form of creation. Um, there's kind of it. It almost seems like it's it's boundless in what you can do with it. Uh, from focusing on an image um, to just the breath and and more. Okay. 
Um, so when, you know, sort of first learning um, these particular, these particular techniques, um, is there sort of some schools of thought, um, you know, for example, there's like the mindfulness camp, um, you know, such as like um, the work of John Kabat-Zinn. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, sort of, are there sort of different schools that you can maybe help us with understanding and the differences between those schools of thought? Um, I, I'm not too sure as far as the schools of thought go. Um, in, in the experience, in in the meditations that I've practiced, like the the med the vipassana meditation retreat was focused on the breath, and and like equanimity. So it's more so kind of rather than focusing on those other kind of methods, it's really taking a step back and and being able to observe the different thoughts and sensations that may arise on the body. Mm -hmm. or and in your mind mm -hmm. okay so that that leads me to think about like someone who might be drawn to um, this type of meditation um, is we've heard these kind of terms of people who you know have lots of anxiety or um, their mind is turning constantly mm -hmm. with different thought patterns or um, worries or stress. And there's just sort of this sense of not being able to separate from it. Yeah. So, so you kind of, what you're saying reminds me of that, like an awareness of your, what they call the monkey brain. Mm -hmm. So kind of what I mentioned earlier about realizing or being coming aware of different preconceived notions, the meditation has its benefits because somebody who had, let's say, insecurity or anxiousness or some level of fear or any of those, we could say, limiting emotion or unserving behaviors that you just mentioned, a lot of it, unfortunately, has to be is we're identifying with those emotions. So when somebody's feeling anxious, somebody's feeling uh, fearful, the, the, the thought or the, the reaction is, oh my God, I am anxious. And that's where the separation gets, uh, what you, you say, kind of, it's hard to separate from it because you're declaring that. And as you learn also with meditation, the body doesn't know the difference between a thought or an actual experience. So you can create that through your thought alone. So in the meditation, you practice and you realize, oh, there's this part of me that's separate than just the thought that arise. And I don't have to identify with the thoughts that arise. You can kind of separate that and you learn things like, oh, thoughts are transient. They come and pass away. So I don't have to identify with this feeling of anxiousness or insecurity that's arising. Mm -hmm. So with somebody, I, too, I think you brought up, I, I may have just missed it, but um, somebody getting started, it, it definitely is a, is a process. And like I, like I shared, it's, I think I myself am early on in, in, in it, having done maybe four or five years. And it started off, like I mentioned, just some, wonderful teacher slowly introducing what it is and you know then it turns into uh headspace or one of those there's many apps these days um just doing five minutes ten minutes just just kind of planting a seed getting a little bit of an idea but you have to continue remaining open and seeing well what more is there what is this really showing me all that meditation is and slowly may develop into more and more like then I began using it uh, before basketball games and and then we started seeing how it also benefited you know life off the court and in other areas of life and just the way you would think and the the perspective of which you would I would see life and be able to notice things a lot more yeah 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 I mean it's um, you know I think back to when I first learned 
meditation. Um, I was on a hike with my father in Sedona, Arizona, and I was probably, I don't know, 12, 13. I don't know. Um, and he, uh, he was into meditation and he took me up to this, uh, this point in Sedona, it was like this hike and it was overlooking this valley with these beautiful red box. And he sat mm -hmm. down and he just started to breathe. And I was like, what are you doing, dad? You know, I didn't know what he was, what he was up to. And, uh, he's like, I'm meditating. And he's like, you should try it. And basically he told me, I asked him, well, what do you, how do you do it? He said, breathe and try to calm your brain. <laughs> and that was like uh -huh. step one. So like, what would be a step one you know, that, that actually worked for me? Um, it was, it was simple instructions, but I think what happens mm -hmm. a lot of times is people are told, you know, you should try this meditation and they say, well, I tried it, but I couldn't turn off my brain. It was just kind of, you yeah. know, I, I'm just not good at it. Like I can't, mm -hmm. you know, I can't calm myself down enough. And I'd love to hear what you, you know, how you guide someone who's like early on in those stages and they're just really having frustrations with that. Mm -hmm. So I've guided a few meditations like a, at a virtual talk I gave and then with some uh, individuals I'm working with. And I really adapted a lot from the silent meditation retreat that I experienced. And so to begin, it would Norm, you would usually just, you know, close the eyes, relax, and just focus on the breath and the in, like through the nose. So like at the retreat, and then how I'll adapt it into guiding somebody is, you know, just focusing in through this kind of triangular area, just the inhalation and the exhalation of the breath. And whenever your focus would, you know, wander, you would just return it to that area and see if you can observe maybe the breath, you know, if you really focus on it, it's a lot cooler when it enters and then a lot warmer when it exhales. And in that kind of guidance, or just even before, like, or listening to something like this, the, it's interesting where, like you mentioned, you know, we have a, a an idea that we have to turn off the brain or I can't get calm enough. But I would argue that's actually means it's a good thing because you're not, the point isn't to, like you mentioned also at the, you're not turning off the brain, not clearing your mind. You're simply um, building the practice or the concentration of becoming aware of what's arising. So it's, it's less about, you know, turning it off and more about just, just noticing because, and, then it kind of helps with, I don't want to say turning it off, but it lowers the volume on those thoughts that in previous, in, in your old self, you would, you would identify with, but they would be very loud and you would react to it or you would, you know, get into a uncompulsive uh, behavior. So by having a focal point, like you mentioned, there were different mantras or you could do a visualization or focusing on the breath, it's that focal point, that focus point to return your uh, attention to whenever it may wander. And then slowly, when you're able to do that, you can notice by becoming more of the observer of the different thoughts that may arise, mm -hmm. which lowers the volume. Yeah, and I think that's the, the essence to me. You know, it's like all day long, we humans kind of are very mm -hmm. goal, goal oriented, task oriented in general, generally, you know, like you, you clock into your job and you have this particular list of things that you need to get accomplished in a given day. And in a sense, you feel some type of mastery over that. You know, it's like, okay, as long as I, as long as I put my head to the um, grindstone and I'm focused and, you know, I'm working hard. I'll, I'll accomplish this list of things. I'll go home and hopefully feel good about my day's work. You sit down mm -hmm. to meditate and it's almost like you just turn that whole model around and, and it's about process and being and, and non actually not doing, it's not about accomplishment, right? It's like a different mindset. It's yeah. 
Yeah, it 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 kind of expands the way in which you approach those your work, those other to dos, but you're not you're no longer going through them and checking the box. You know, I went to work today. I picked up groceries, yada yada yada, and going through it because then you're kind of you're getting somewhere. But ultimately, where we want to get to, you know, is now. You know, we can. You have those aspirations. You have those great goals. You know, myself as well. I'm, I'm very creative. I have a a beautiful vision. You know, of my my future and things I want to experience. Um, but if I'm, you know, busting my butt or hustling and trying to get it, you know, then you're kind of separate from it. So with the practice of the meditation, you really, like you said, you're you're less doing and more being. So then you're, you know, it's not ir- really ironic, but you actually attend to those things more effectively, more productively, because you become more present, you become more in it, no longer separate to where you're going or, or, or trying to just get out of doing something. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I think anxiety, anxiety disorders or you know, stress disorders, really, that's one of the biggest challenges is, is being able to separate from your fear, your insecurities, from your um, worries, your troubles, and being able to, to feel safe in the present moment. So that was really well, well described. Um, I, um, so, you know, getting to I want to get into the retreat you went on in just a second, mm-hmm. but I'd just like to kind of talk about how this plays out also with other health problems. So okay. for example, there's a, a big classification of health conditions called somatic health problems. You know, these are like problems that involve the mind and body. So there's pain disorders that involve the mind body. Um, there's digestive disorders that involve the mind body, of course, insomnia and stress, other stress problems. How would this kind of play out in health? Like if I was to implement a meditation practice and let's say I have like a digestive problem, how would, how would this maybe help? Yeah. So the, I'll, I'll start with the kind of um, reference in which it, where I learned a lot about the science of meditation and used to explain how it'll help in this, uh, you know, bodily function and um, digest you know, all the organ systems and so on. And that would be through uh, the work of Dr. Joe Dispenza. I know you and I mentioned it and discussed a little bit of his uh, books, um, yeah. but I'd like to state that first because that's where I learned a lot of the different science to mm-hmm. it. And like I mentioned a little bit earlier, and it also complements the work that I experienced and learned at their meditation retreat um, and probably even helped me when I went there uh, because I understood about the different the science to it. And so the way it would help is that our body is, is, is like a kind of like an animal in a sense. It has its reactions. And I mentioned earlier that it's objective. It doesn't know the difference between a thought or a real experience. So we have different things that we react to in our environment and that comes from the things in the past in which we we unconsciously create some kind of um, conclusion or belief about a situation and on a animal kind of um, point you know an animal has to run away from a threat it's very beneficial so all of its attention focuses on the cause that made its internal environment, you know, change and make it feel that it's in, it's perceiving a threat. So it uses all of its resources to get safe. But then when it's safe, you know, it returns to homeostasis and it begins to get back into growth and repair ourselves because we have our, our, our forebrain and our conscious brain has developed so much when we come across somebody, you know, uh, let's say an abusive relationship or uh, some coworker or, you know, maybe somebody in our family, whatever, that 
we concluded some belief that we don't feel safe around and we continue that thought and create that belief continuously, then we're in a sense still thinking the animal, like as the, from the animal point of view, we're still thinking we're under threat. So the body's never really getting a chance to repair. So with the practice of meditation, you're becoming film familiar with all the stuff we mentioned earlier. You're you're separating from your your um, conscious brain, not really, but you're you're lowering the volume on it on the neocortex to be able so that you're no longer reacting to all that stuff that happened before. Which means so now if you're kind of taking yourself out of it, not really taking yourself out of it, but you know lowering the volume on the conscious brain because i know like for myself first hearing that taking my spit what you talking about mm -hmm. like but by turning the volume down it in, it in a sense gives the body the chance to relax to return to that state of growth and repair and then that in turn because there's these different systems you know in our body and as you even learned and you've shared with me we have these different uh, parts in our system correlate like or um, illnesses or diseases that correspond to exactly that some kind of maybe reaction uh, or um, um, limited belief in, in the brain or, or yeah, in the brain. So when we really kind of step out and, and observe it, it gives that body, the autonomic nervous system can step in and begin to, take over and, and heal and return the body back to a, a more optimal uh, state of balance, homeostasis. Yeah. Really well said. Yeah. So like I think about, um, I've had a lot of discussions and even some guests on my podcast talking about the vagus nerve, you know, mm -hmm. and there's activating, there's different branches of the vagus nerve and the branch that sounds like you're activating is the one that's toning the parasympathetic nervous system, you know, and, and helping put the brakes on that kind of fear cycle. And, you know, it's, I always think about like people who meditate and I think one of my early aversions to it is like, you know, if I get really into this, am I just going to be so chilled out that <laughs> if, if something happened where I actually really needed to, you know, go into flight or flight mode, am I going to be clued, yeah. not clued into it? <laughs> and so, yeah, it, it was just interesting it, to see that actually you get, you, in my experience, you get better at calling. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Could you, could you speak it's, more to that? So kind of um, following on what, or complimenting on what, um, what I was mentioning earlier, when you when you kind of step back and, and and allow the autonomic nervous system to to take over to heal, then parts of your brain are also communicating a lot more clearly. You know, if there's they've showed brain scans that somebody may be thinking, uh, you know, have, be having feelings of depression and thinking of the past or anxiousness thinking in the future, it's, it's similar on the brain scan. And it's when it's that when it's that way, you're 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 more in a convergent focus. So you're you're a, a, the parts of the brain aren't communicating as properly because you you are you are telling your body and it's in a state of threat, a state of survival. So by practice practicing the meditation, and and building your concentration, building your focus. Uh, allowing yourself to kind of get out of the way, the brain begins to communicate more clearly. The bandula oblongata, I think I pronounced that correctly, yeah. begins, or the gray matter even begins to 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 um, band, to increase. So then you have, you know, uh, circuits staring more clearly. So then, in, like what you just mentioned, you know, we think that uh, maybe will be just so blissed out actually you know we're we're more aware of our environment we're more aware and picking up different minute details so we're actually going to be able to respond a lot more effectively mm -hmm. 
to that, especially more and more with practice. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think when you're in a constant mode of stress, meaning like you wake up and I'm as guilty as anybody. So this is not coming from a place of, you know, me judging this is you wake up, you pound the coffee, you get the kids out the door, you get in your car, you go to your, in the commute into the, into the traffic, you get to your work, your boss has a stack of things on your desk that you didn't prepare for, for the day. Um, you're running late to your meetings. It's like, go, 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 stress, stress, stress. That's all you know. You can actually become so hooked into that, that you, you feel actually awkward if you step out of it. And I think that's one of the aversions to meditation is mm -hmm. like this kind of adrenaline need. And then if, if you sit down to meditation, you just, like you said in the beginning, you fall asleep. You're like, wait, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. But actually, maybe that is what you're supposed to be doing yeah. in the beginning. Well, because get... we we get so, we get, because we get so stuck to our routines. We are habitual kind of creatures. So the if 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 we continuously do those, you know, same behaviors and we're thinking the same way we're doing the same things you know nothing's going to change and the brain isn't going to change at all either so by by taking the time to you know practice this and step out you become familiar of those different ways in which you've been thinking behaving and and feeling mm -hmm. which then allows from the brain to kind of consolidate all that you've been doing and, and wow, realize, wow, I've been doing this, you know, I've been just been doing the same things, thinking the same ways, nothing, if I do that, nothing in my life will change or anybody's yeah. life. So it's almost like it's, those, those pathways become automatic and you, you lose the flexibility and the creativity and the plasticity. Yeah. And, and we've kind of become programmed. Mm -hmm. to, to do the same things yeah so in a sense that it allows for it allows for a greater awareness to then realize maybe you know i've been doing something you know we, we often get to a point where we want something in our life to change like myself when i was wanting was transitioning from playing basketball in college and studying business uh, and wanted to and realized, you know, that I was more passionate about the health and the process that went into like, you know, becoming a great athlete. The meditation allowed the meditation and journaling is another thing, but allowed for myself to kind of step back and build that awareness to realize, oh, my gosh, I've been doing this, you know, my whole life and thinking the same way about it. And I've had similar experiences turn up or arise from that. So in a sense, as I began to practice more and more, you know, I realized, you know, become aware of the ways that I've been doing the things that I've been doing, the way that I've been feeling about all that I've been doing, you know, going to school, playing basketball. And, you know, I want, I no longer wanted to live by those emotions and think those same ways. So it really allowed to, for that, like I said, build an awareness to realize all that I had been habitually doing so that now I can change. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So I'd like to Which go is in. liberating because like you mentioned uh, earlier, we, it's hard to separate from those emotions that we have been feel, feeling those thoughts that we often think there's um, because we, often continue doing the same thing and we want something in our environment or our life to change but really it's ourselves that needs to change and once we change that you know we we see more opportunities we see other uh, op, uh, possibilities yeah i mean at its core um to change you have to think different and do things different right so um you know it's it it just doesn't kind of happen you know, yeah, you have to actually have to be an active participant in that process. And it's really interesting. I remember you saying this on the hike about how you became more self-referring 
um, in your thought process, like, um, you know, where maybe before your thoughts or your beliefs were automatic um, based on the environment you were in or what have you, or the environment you came up in. And then you started ask, uh, asking yourself, like, what do I really feel and think about this? Yeah. You know, which is, you know, when, when I interact with you, you can really see that, that this is something that's coming from you, not just something that you're kind of repeating. Relaying, yeah. So um, that's really good. I'd like to dive into the basketball kind of uh, topic a little bit more because you and I share um, a lot of past background in the, the sport of basketball. And to me, basketball has always been more of an art and mm -hmm. like it's it's like music to me like the court and the rhythm of it and the energy it, to me it was just it, it, it when you were out there playing it was it was like a performance of like movement art dance and one of the things about meditation that connects here is that you know it is it's a it's like a practice like what that means is that you're practicing this on a daily basis for real world scenarios where you actually need to be present. You need to be mindful. You need to stay calm. You need to be centered. You need to access your resources, whether it's in life, work with family members, with conflicts. So it it's, it's actually a practice. And so it reminds me of like someone we both have a fondness for like Kobe Bryant, you know, and, um, may you rest in peace. And uh, the the fact is, is that, you know, Kobe would say, you know, you should practice as if you're, you're playing, you mm -hmm. know, in the real thing. Like, you know, you don't want to just like meditate when, you know, everything's just right. Okay. Like yeah. it's a, got a good night's sleep. I, you know, I had a great, um, uh, day yesterday um yeah. I feel really good and happy today like can you talk about that like this kind of i don't want to call it you never want the feelings you never want the feelings to be the um the marker for change because our feelings are are ch often change you know it's, wait say, they're, say they're more about that say more about that if if we if we allow you know our our feelings to be the you know our feelings have a place of course you know you know there's the whole like facts versus feeling and feelings versus facts you know people you'll hear you know facts don't care about your feelings but neither do your feelings care about your facts and uh, you have to of course honor them but if we m m put too much emphasis on them you know like we want something to change in our life and you know you feel good so oh i don't need to meditate today then then they're become you're you're making that the mode for change which as you know then then something in the environment may arise that knocks you back off balance and how do you respond to it yeah and i think this is an important point because you're pointing out that um, you know, making the choice to not meditate on a good day. And I'm making the point to, um, to well, not, yeah. to not only meditate on a good day. So yeah. like in this real world practice of meditation, it's like you step up, you try to do it every day as best you can. And on the, the difficult days, or even on the good days when you're like, I don't need this. Um, this is, this is what I would say really pays off. What do you think about that? You, you really got to just fall in love with doing it. You know, whether it's a sport or an instrument or writing or speaking, you just got to love that, that process, that practicing of it, which of course, when you're first starting out, like in, in myself, it, it, it took a little bit of time to really, well, I can't, I can't actually not too much, but to really like just fall in love with doing it no matter what, without even having that kind of internal um, conversation. Do I need to do it today? You know, or any of that. You just, it's like not even a question anymore. It's become like, 
you know, do you use the bathroom each day? Yeah, of course. So like, it's, it's just become something like that. So if we allow the, the feeling, if, it, if it's a good day and, or, or a bad day, or, you know, whatever that means, not, you also kind of learn to reframe there. There's no such thing as a good day or a bad day. There may be a pleasant day or an unpleasant day, but you know, all days are good. Um, and I think that reframe also helps with, you know, getting up early and making the time for yourself to do it because the more and more you, you practice it and really just learn more about it as well, you know, the study about it and how it benefits you and you can add more meaning to it, you'll, you'll start to see a lot and experience a lot of the benefits in your, your health and yeah, health in the whole, in its whole term. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I think, you know, a lot of people are in the process of always making changes. This is, this is kind of one of these things that I think can, you know, if people develop a practice, they can sort of observe their choices throughout the day. Like, for example, choosing to stay up later instead of going to bed when they know they need to get rest or choosing to have those, you know, sort of um, stress eating behaviors, you know, when mm -hmm. they could choose something else because they're present with their mind and body process. Um, so it, it's, it's really, really exceptional. So you, I mean, when, when I was going through, um, naturopathic medical school, a bunch of my you know colleagues would go, you know, kind of come up to me and say, Hey, do you want to go on this retreat? You know, we're going to, we're not going to talk for, like 10 days do you do you want to go on this retreat with us and you know i always passed on it i just mm -hmm. to me i had done some some similar types of retreats but nothing that involved you know sort of being in a comp uh contemplative state for that long of time you chose to go on one of these retreats can you tell us about this yeah so um in december 2019 I think it was the beginning of the month. I went to this 10 day silent meditation retreat. I had a friend that went there before and like the year before that, and I had been interested in it. And um, I think I met up with him in the summertime and, you know, he just told me about it and, you know, you sign up to be on the waiting list and I happened to go. And I had a, that very good family friend who I mentioned at the beginning also highly encouraged it. And she's been on a bunch so I felt very um, supported and safe in going into that because, you know, it is, it can be very intense um, for the reasons that, you know, like you said, you're, you're there quiet, you're silent, uh, and you're experiencing yourself for probably one of the first times in such a raw state. You don't have your phone. Uh, or anything, or any really belongings, you know, I chose to kind of sneak in my journal, and uh, like my prayer book, you know, the sitter and to fill in. But as you read in my um, um, kind of, I, I shared with you a few of the journal entries I wrote. Um, I learned a lot about myself towards those, those objects as well. Um, but in that process, like you, you said, it, it's pro it was the first time I was, you know, with myself, like completely, of course, you're, you're definitely safe because you're in a, an ideal environment, um, away from, you know, the city you're with other people, but you're kind of in a state of, as if you're by yourself to get, cause people it's, it's serious work, you know, it's, it's, it's light in a sense because you you're learning about yourself and your body you're giving your body a chance to heal but it's also very it's serious work because some people really have some um, traumatic experiences that working through it can be very very turbulent but the process would you like me to now dive into really what went into it yeah yeah, yeah. so the first three days you have to like it started in the evening because you pass all your belongings and stuff. But the first three days was really to learn the concepts uh, of like building the awareness 
and having equanimity of mind. And so we started the first three days just focusing like on this triangular area. I think I mentioned earlier when I was you were talking about getting into the meditation. But when you really want to build concentration, you want to start on like a small point, just like also if you're playing a playing basketball, you know, you before you go straight into, you know, layups and shooting threes, you just dribble the ball or do a close up layup or playing the instrument. You're just starting with a few keys, but it's really building the concentration. And for three days uh, from for ten and a half hours in the in the each day from four thirty to six thirty, then you had like breakfast, and then there was like a, an hour for lunch and uh, an hour for um, uh, like a fruit and tea, and then like a lecture in the evening. But we those first three days we would just focus on that area and the inhalation and the exhalation, and see if you could even notice any sensations in that area. It was my first time really kind of practicing it. I had been practicing Dr. Joe's meditation, so I had built a practice, but I even still wasn't so aware of different sensations on my nose. But it was really to build that practice of whenever you are aware, you're building the awareness of the breath and the sensations on in that area. And whenever your mind would wander, returning it there. But one of the main key components, the equanimity that you brought up, is that levelness and calmness of mind and objective um, view of objective judgment of where your mind wanders, the sensations on the nose, the breath. It's just like a scientist taking an experiment you know, he's boiling water in the, in the beaker. He's not reacting, oh, my God, that's hot. You know, he's just... He's observing. Of it. He's observing, yeah. it. exactly. And so after those first three days, because re- that really hones in and builds on those main components, then we slowly move to the fourth day through the end from the top of the head, where, like, uh, I forgot the scientific name of it, but where it's a little soft spot. The penile uh, gland. Not the pineal gland the, on the fo- on the skull, oh, the fossa, the, the something like that, yeah. yeah. And it's like the soft, uh, softer mm-hmm. spot where we place our tefillin, as well. And we would just observe and go down slowly from that top of the head all the way down to the toes, and then toes back up. And you would build that practice of noticing when your attention, when you, where your thoughts may go, and just returning it to the sensations on the body and just notice where if you have this thought where is it arising on the body and become aware of oh there might be a lot of tension in a certain area of the body but not reacting to it that's the equanimity part just becoming aware and oh it's you know it's it's gross or it's feeble it's intense or it's like it's highly intense and it's moderate it's unpleasant it's pleasant nothing about good bad uh because that would evoke a reaction and then you would get rid of it so like myself i mentioned at the the beginning i had a nail biting habit uh growing up so when i'm going through this process and from most of the day out of my habitual routine and i'm no longer uh you know i'm sitting still and i have thoughts that may that usually would evoke my this reaction to bite my fingernails and I'm no longer doing it. Like it was very intense in the wrists and the hands when normally I would resist that. But now I'm simply just observing it and noticing how it's very intense, but I'm not averting it. I'm not or craving something. Mm-hmm. I'm just allowing it as it is, or I'm just observing it as it is which allows it, like we mentioned earlier, with kind of stepping about to heal, to allow the all of those emotions and, and thoughts to arise so that they can pass away. And like pus coming out of wound, it's it gets very intense right before, you know, it kind of clears and frees. So that's kind of like the, the main process that kind of went into or like the main technique that went into it. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it you by by stepping out by practicing this 
equan equanimous approach, noticing things arise and pass away, and you you're not reacting to them. It allows for this kind of healing to take place, and then the brain is connecting a lot more. You're thinking a lot clearer. Your body is and arriving and returning more to the present moment, mm -hmm. and release happens yeah. and yeah. yeah reminds me of like being caught in a riptide in the ocean you know the, you know the, the instructions are to not struggle and not swim against you know what's happening even though you feel like you're being swept up into this place this dangerous place and then before you know it you're kicked out of the riptide and in peaceful waters <laughs> yeah. um yeah that that was really beautifully said. It was like that the first few days for sure. That's that's when it was very intense. But it's like, you know, it's 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 easier said than done, obviously. Like, you know, that is essentially what happens in anxiety is those thoughts rise, those future possibilities rise, and they become our reality. Um yeah. and so the separation between Re, um, the future and the present becomes mushed together. Mm -hmm. and, I like to look at it kind of like a, a a tree. Like we, the thoughts that we have throughout the day are like the the branches and like the even the leaves or the smaller branches. But in order, a lot of those thoughts, like what's the source of which they arise out of? For myself, maybe it was a lot of uh, insecurity or uncertainty. And depending on, there's also maybe individual may have thoughts that are based out of fear or frustration. So by practicing the awareness and the concentration and no longer judging it by the equanimity, then it allows you kind of to trace back to that source and allow that um that emotion where it's all based out of to arise and then pass away. So you're not thinking from a place of fear or a limited uh, emotion, but more of a, from a place of wholeness and, and safety and health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the things that um, as I'm talking with you, I know that you help a lot of people um, with various areas of health that you and I have talked how you want to help people with meditation, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of one of the ways you want to coach people, guide people, lead people. So um, are you actively doing that these days with trying to kind of helping people get connected to meditation? Yeah, the, I definitely am in growing with that and want to be able to guide it more and share it more and all the benefits. And of course, I'm learning a lot more about it myself. Uh, the different individuals that I have been helping as well as with uh, the uh, like talk that I've given or when I just share with somebody, it's another tool, an element of which to help with your health or goals or whatever. Because let's say, you know what, you want to be healthy or like you're sharing, even somebody had a, maybe a digestive problem we may think our only way to address it is via, you know, nutrition or some other approach or fitness, um, you know, you name it, something external. But with the meditation, it adds another element to approach it and may even help, you know, achieve your health goals or just be a healthier person or whatever, whatever the vision is. Yeah, by by sh by showing a more expansive approach to it. Yeah, and you know, I think um, like anything, um, I I always encourage people not to be overwhelmed by starting it. And even just like a few minutes a day could be a good starting point. Um, also, like people don't realize, but um, I mean, you can meditate while you're in line at a store. You can meditate, you know, when you're waiting in a car, you know, to pick your kids up from school, you can meditate, um, you know, when you're, you're uh, in the shower, you, you know, like you can find these little moments that doesn't have to be kind of like the, the classic, yeah. like I'm sitting on this mat in a room that has like 
candles lit and everything doesn't have to be perfect. Like I was saying, like learning how to bring meditation into your day to day moments. Um, that's that's the the continuous arrival to to be able to live in that state. Mm -hmm. That makes the, and the the practice. I mean, but it's 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 it is challenging, especially with all the different external stimuli throughout a day from, you know, your phone to just things you could pay attention to in any given moment. So that's where the practice of the meditation really um, is beneficial because you're closing out that sensory information, like the visual information and audio to be able to you. So when then it's closing out all those other stimuli that may come in, so then you can practice it and really build that. So then when you step out into the day, you've already practiced it a little bit to build that muscle. Yeah. I'm just going to throw up here a comment by uh, Matt. Um, and, you know, he's, he, he likes to walk in nature. And, you know, I think there is like some meditative practices that are all involved with walking meditation. In fact, mm -hmm. um, I know there's some teachers out of Vietnam and um, other schools that I've seen that, you know, will actually teach walking meditation. And uh, there was a time during the shutdown um, that I was in my town in Bellevue. And for the first time I was in this, this uh, trail by my house that I could not hear any cars or noise because everybody was kind of shut down. It was the most peaceful surprise for me because I, I, I was able to completely connect with my community without having to drive mm -hmm. an hour or two away. Um, but yeah, I agree with Matt here that a walk, um, you know, connecting with the fresh air, the trees, the beauty. So um, yeah, it's, these are all really good things. So if I, I'd really like to spend the last part of our conversation um, kind of hearing first um, about how people can work with you. Um, you know, I, as we were speaking, you know, I can think of several people that would really, really need to be led into this space. And they've, they've shared with me that they, they want to learn how to meditate. It's just not their true nature, or they just don't think it's their true nature. Um, also, I want to hear like maybe some take home messages before we go, but if you could first just kind of share like your website, tell, tell us a little bit about your podcast. Um, mm -hmm. I was a guest on your podcast. Um, you were. Thank you for that. And uh, yeah, I'd love to hear just more about like how people can get in touch with you and then maybe some take home messages. Yeah. Um, anyone you may know, you, you can, of course, forward me. You have my number, um, my email, or you can go to my website, SolomonEzra.com, S-O-L-O-M-O-N-E-Z-R-A.com. And you can either email me through there um, or, yeah, I think that that's probably the best way or just referred f through you. I have a okay. podcast, uh, Ebb and Flow, E-B-B and Flow. And it's really based on um, that state that I would get into as an athlete, that state of flow and learning from, you know, top individuals like yourself and in physical and mental health and spiritual health. Um to really be able to cultivate, you know, and, and live in that state of flow or that meditative state where we're not reacting. Like I was talking about at their meditation retreat to the different thoughts that may arise and, and taking that on a grander scale to our whole life where we're not reacting to, you know, simple things like somebody may cut us off or God forbid car accidents we're in such a great state, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, that we handle those and we respond to them effectively without judgment. So just like, you know, as an athlete, I would turn the ball over. But as whenever I would be in the state of flow, I wouldn't react to it. And ultimately, it would turn into something better that I couldn't even imagine at the time, if I were to react to the um, turnover, or the, the quote, unquote, negative situation. Um, so that's really what the the podcast is about. Excellent. Well, I've really enjoyed speaking with you. And to my listeners, I think you guys are um, 
you are experiencing someone who's going to be really out there helping a lot of people and he'll probably be on a lot of podcasts um, in the future and you'll be hearing about him because I, I know a good one when I see him and uh, I have really a lot of joy and hope for our future with um, practitioners like Solomon out there trying to help help the world. Um, so um, thank you for sharing this time with us and um, you know, look forward to kind of seeing you develop and learning more about the the different practices that you you teach people. Thank you so much, Adam. All your compliments and, and dear words are very, very meaningful and it definitely just it hits home. So thank you so much. You bet. God willing, God willing can continue to share the message and and the practice uh, because it it's just uh, you know it's 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 brought so much joy and light to, to my own life and people that I know and um, yeah just want to continue continue sharing and giving excellent all right well thank you thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode of the one thing podcast please share these episodes with your friends loved ones colleagues patients healthcare providers anyone who you feel might benefit from hearing these informative interviews. We tend to learn best from people sharing things with us. That's often the first time it's introduced. So don't hesitate if these the content of these episodes reminded you of someone that might benefit from it. Forward the, the episode to them and I'm sure they'll either appreciate it or be appreciative that you've thought of them. So once again, we'll look forward to seeing you next episode on the one thing podcast and again much appreciation for you being here with me